Uh, Mary Lemieux's dog bit my dog once. Uh, it's a fact. He's my neighbor. I live on the wrong side of the tracks. I was walking my dog past Lemieux's house. His little animal peeked his head through his nine fences, eight hedges, and eight poles that he has, and nipped my dog in Turner. You know my dog, my, my pit bull, who then ran like a punk. Uh, I, and I thought to myself, Baby. I should sue. <laughs> well, you will settle. Oh, yeah. Hundred grand. That's like don't make it rain. Here Chump you go. change. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, so I, that 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 leads us to you. Oh, thanks. Oh, ch the chump change. <laughs> uh, uh, Mary Beth's up next. Mary Beth, we've known each other for a while. She actually, we yep. uh, we kind of met through a mutual acquaintance, uh, Mark mm -hmm. Watts, who she started her career under. Mark Watts. Hopefully, all you guys know Mark. He's he's my guy. I love Mark to death. Um, fun fact, me and Mark Watts played Pee Wee football against each other for six years. Um, I have 6-0 and against him. You can go check that. It's, it's a fact. Um, but we actually played our rival Pee Wee football teams, like two miles apart. And we did win five of the six championships. Um, so I'm not lying when I said I'm 6-0 against Wattsy. But um, he was actually the same height, though. Uh, I can make it short. That makes it, yeah, yeah. He's You're just, me. yeah. <laughs> and I'm short. But, um, but I do want to share a story about Mary Beth before, uh, before she starts real quick. So Mary Beth and her husband, when, when, they, when they came to Pittsburgh, they said, hey, we want to come out and train. He's the only cool training group. And her husband, was, is he here? He's not here, uh, unfortunately. Man, uh, he, uh, he, 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 we started pulling that day. And he said, I never pulled five. I'm like, you can pull five. And I yeah. told you the story yeah. yesterday, right? Uh -huh. yeah. We're out 455. He smokes it. And things are going yeah. well. And we're like, were you there that day? Yeah. It's like five on the bar. And I, I'm going to screw the story up, but I'll get the best I can. <laughs> and he smokes five. Boom. We're like, over two or something like that, right? He says, no. Oh, and he falls over. <laughs> and so we, first time we trained with a guy, and I don't even know if I'd met Bobby before. I don't think so. We roll the bar over here. Continue deadlifting. <laughs> He's on the session. ground. We're like, dude, you alive? <laughs> um, and and to me, that was a sign of respect. Like I, I still kind of feel a little guilty about, it, but at the same time, like you came here to train. You know, yeah. this is this is life and death. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna do it. You die, you die. <laughs> um, yeah, if he dies, he dies. Yeah. This is no big, no big deal. No big deal. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, that happened last night. Gary here decided just to work up to 500 plus 9,000 pounds of band tension. Did a speed pull. I missed it. And then he goes, I'm done. And I'm thinking, yeah, you've done your speed work for today. So, um, so if you ever want a deadlift, please come join us. You may win. You may lose. You may die. We'll have fun and we eat some steaks yeah. afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Um, Brian will drink the whiskey. But <laughs> that's your intro, Mary. Thanks. That's perfect. That's Mary, perfect. Where's yours? All right. Thank you. Um, well, first off, I'm Mary Beth George. I'm an assistant at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I've been there now going on five years, so seen a lot of changes over the last couple of years um, just within our strength and condi conditioning department alone. Um, as First off, thank you to Coach Hammer. He did a great intro. Um, and to CJ for inviting me here to speak. Comparatively to everybody else who went before me, I'm probably the one with the least amount of training age here. Um, this is only my second clinic that I've spoke at, so bear with me, please. Um, I'd like to thank Matt Nine. He actually might be watching on Facebook, um, but he was uh, my strength coach as I was a GA at Salisbury University. And I'm going to throw him a little plug, but he was just named the NSCA Strength Coach of the Year. So um, he's done a lot of great things at Salisbury and taught me a lot of what I know. Tim Teefee and Phil Matus, I worked with them at Villanova. Um, they're now at Temple and Ohio State. Um, Phil works with Mickey Marotti on the football side there. Um, as Hammer said, Mark Watts, he pretty much made me who I am today. Um, he was my strength coach at Denison University um, and made me love lifting weights. And then my husband, Bobby George, uh, behind every great strength coach, there is a great spouse or a significant other. If you don't have that support, then you can't do what you do. Um, so just kind of a little bit um, about what I'm going to talk about. I'll tell you my background. Um, and then from there, we'll go um, what draws you into strength and conditioning and why you do what you do. Um, but then going into the challenges of being a strength and conditioning coach, I'm sure you guys all have 
probably experienced a lot of what, of what I'm going to talk about. So, and I might miss something. So if I do, please tell me. Um, I want to make this more of a discussion than me just kind of talking at you. Um, but then we'll talk about overcoming coming those challenges and some benefits of why we do what we do. Um, so like I said, I started out at Denison University. I was a softball player there. Um, actually, my freshman year there, we didn't have a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, my softball coach gave us a nice little program that told us to go to the student rec center, and it was basically a nice hit training program. And my sophomore year is when Mark Watts came back from um, coaching at Army, and he basically taught me everything I know about strength and conditioning. Um, from there, I interviewed, or interviewed, sorry, interned uh, at the University of Louisville under Tina Murray in the Olympic side. Um, having that female strength coach um, basically told me that I could do this. If you look here, there's not very many of us, and I'll kind of touch on that later, um, but this is a male-dominated field. Uh, interned at the NSCA. And there, got to work with a lot of tactical athletes, you know, out in Colorado. Um, but that was a different animal. So a lot of those tactical athletes um, have a totally different mindset than collegiate athletes. So it gave me a different way to approach the collegiate side. Um, Salisbury was a GA there, and Matt Nine really gave me um, a lot of freedom to kind of go and fail, um, just like Coach Lemieux said. You know, don't be afraid to let your people fail because, especially interns, like we expect you guys to make mistakes. Um, we know you guys aren't don't know it all. I fail, you know, once a week, and that's okay because you're always going to be learning. Um, went to Villanova after that for a little bit. Was a paid intern there, um, and you know, like I said, there I worked with football, which was a great opportunity um, to be at the Division One level and work with football there. And then I came to Pitt. Um, and like I said, at Pitt, have had a lot of opportunities. My volleyball team this last year just went to the NCAA tournament. So I've seen a lot of fails and a lot of success there. Um, so I was drawn to the field, being a softball player, being where I was. Um, and then all my coaches and mentors in the past, you know, they kind of saw that leadership in me and said, hey, that would be a great thing for you to do. And of course, I can't imagine sitting behind a desk. Um, Paul. I know you made the change and you sit behind the desk now, um, but I know that's not something that I can do personally um, because I'd rather teach others and being an, in an untraditional atmosphere in the weight room, it's something great. Um, one of the biggest things when I was younger, I still am pretty young, I like to think, um, but I doubted myself a lot. So I wanted to prove to myself that I could do something that others told me I couldn't do. Um, and then I have a passion. It's just kind of, you got to love what you do, especially in this field. So for you guys, you can kind of fill in the blanks and there's probably way more things than just this. Um, but what does it mean to be a collegiate strength and conditioning coach? Um, you're a mentor, so you're a role model to your athletes, um, and you're a confidant to them. So like they'll come and tell you things that they might not tell their sport coach. Um, and you kind of have to stick to your morals and things like that to kind of guide them in the right way. You're an educator. So not only do we teach them how to lift weights, how to get better with speed mechanics and things like that, um, and we not only evaluate them with testing and things like that, but we answer their questions of why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, that goes along with sport coaches. A lot of times you have to educate your sport coaches of why you're doing something um, and along those lines. You're a supporter, so you're on the sidelines, especially with volleyball. I traveled with them to the NCAA tournament. My only role there was to warm them up in the beginning of the game and then to sit on the bench and cheer them on, right? Um, and when they see that, that gives you another connection with them. Uh, but then you're also a builder. So, you know, performance enhancement, that's your number one thing. But then we all know that 99% of the athletes we work with are not going to go pro. So you got to teach them other things like accountability and um, other life skills, which basically sets your student athlete up for success. Um, so what does it mean to be a female strength coach? Um, this is a little bit different. I'm kind of throwing this in with you guys. Um, but we're a minority 
if there's what two of us, three of us here right now as females. 15% um, of the females or 15% of the field is females. Um, and of that 15%, only 2% coach males, meaning football, basketball, you know, any other male sports. Um, this is kind of changing over the years. If you go to other, you know, major conferences and things like that, you see more and more females. Um, but you don't see a lot of female head coaches out there. Um, but being a female coach, you can relate to your female athletes in different ways. Um, one example, um, during your monthly cycle, menstrual cycle, um, I know when I train, I feel a lot weaker at that point. Whereas at being a male, you might not feel that, you might not know that. So I can relate to my females, I can probably pick out every time a female is on their period because I can see it just in the way they act and the way they train. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't mean that I go easier on those females, but then I can emphasize with them a little bit easier. So some of the challenges, and like I said, there's probably a lot more, and you guys have probably experienced 99% of these, um, but time management is one, training facilities and equipment, technology, social media, overcoming perceptions, uh, sport coaches, gaining trust and earning respect of your sport coaches, administration, athletes, um, salary and job security. You heard a lot about some of the older strength coaches talked about earlier. Um, but then certifications, some of our interns breaking into the field, and then family at the end. Um, so time management to start with. Um, recently, the NCAA came out with rare hours, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, but with those hours now, you have to take an additional 14 days off within your um, training cycle. So actually I just sat down with our volleyball coach on the day after we got back from the tournament and he said, hey, what are the best days to take off in your training cycle? So one, that was awesome because he knows how important our training is, but then two, um, you know, we're kind of limited and I have to work with those. So it's a plus and a minus. Um, if you're at the, you know, division three level, you might have to find other ways to work around because I know off season is um, all optional. You don't have any training time there. So how do you do it? Do you say that you're just watching for safety? That you know a strength coach is there? Do you have a strength and conditioning class that your student athletes have to sign up for? There are different ways that you can work around it, um, but still get your student athletes in to train. Uh, for the most part, we only have 45 to 60 minutes with our athletes in a training session. And then if they're in season, you know, days get cut. So how are you going to achieve your training goals in the amount of time that you have with your student athletes? Um, and that can go down to, you know, your phase, your mi macro cycle, micro cycle, things like that. Um, I'll give you an example of this. When I, it was probably my second year at Pitt, our women's soccer team, they were out of season and I only had 30, min 30 minutes with them twice a week. So I had an hour out of season to try to build strength. <coughs> How do you do that, right? So that was one of my challenges that I had to work with. Um, one of the things we ended up coming up with is, you know, we got the meat and potatoes in, so we did our squats, deadlifts. Um, I didn't even teach them Olympic lifts because that was going to take up too much time. We did a lot of med ball work. Um, but then out of that, I gave them all their accessory lifts and their prehab movements, things like that, were extra. So if they wanted to do it, they stayed after. It was a shitty way of doing it, but that's kind of how we had to work around that. Training facilities and equipment. Not everybody has the best training facility. And, you know, at Pitt, we're actually lucky. We're going to be doing a renovation here soon, um, getting new flooring, all brand new racks things like that. Um, but I know being at the Division three level before, not everybody has that opportunity. At Salisbury, we shared the weight room with the recreation department. With that, we had to send our interns in a half hour before our training session to hold racks for our student athletes. So, um, you know, there's just what you have to do. Um, at Villanova, that was when um, the weight room was actually underneath the stadium at that point. Um, since then, they've gotten a new weight room, but we had teams, because there were so many teams, we had teams on the half hour. 
So we would start teams um, you know, with their main lifts and the way that we had the weight room flow, it actually worked out pretty well. Um, all the coaches were on the same page and a lot of that goes down to communication with your staff. At Pitt, um, our tennis team and our track team do not have home facilities. So our tennis team actually has to drive a half hour up to Wexford um, to do their training because they have indoor courts up there. And then our track team either goes to Carnegie Mellon or another place that has a track. Um, with that, they don't have time to lift around practice because they're traveling. So, you know, that leads us to heavy mornings. So it just all works into talking, communicating with your staff and figuring out schedules. Technology can be challenging. Um, so especially now, there's a lot of technologies out on the market, whether it's software or gadgets such as Tendo units, things like that. So you really got to ask yourself, why are you using it? The data that you're collecting, what are you doing with that data? Um, a lot of the sport coaches, especially <coughs> soccer coaches, um, you know, they want catapult and heart rate monitoring. Um, but what, what are they going to do with that? How are they going to use that data? Do they even know what the data means? Um, I know with Kent, Bob, uh, Coach Lemieux just said that they had someone who's really good with that on staff. Um, so it's all within your scope of practice and kind of how can you deal with it? Does your school even have the budget for some of that stuff? Um, if you do have the budget, what works? You gotta look at your program that you're running and your student athletes, your sport coach, see what they want. Um, don't just use technology to use it. Um, and then what's right for your student athletes? Um, so don't get away from the basis of training. And you heard um, Coach Harvey, you heard uh, Brian Mann, they all said you still gotta get stronger. Coach, you even said it, you still gotta do the nuts and bolts um, but this is just something that can help augment your training. Social media. Um, so you can use social media to help promote your programming or help your program um, as far as your student athlete, you know, whether you're testing or whatever it is, just to kind of show and put your program on the map. Um, but if you're not ca careful, I know there's probably a lot of you out there who have heard people say, oh, have you seen that video out on that program? Or, you know, there's a lot of things. And not everybody knows, you know, that's just a snapshot. Um, but I know Hammer put out something the other day of a girl doing a Turkish getup, right? It was her first time doing it. On her second rep, she was already that much better. Um, Sport coaches, a lot of your sport coaches will send you, I've got it every day, a sport coach will send me a video saying, hey, can we put this in our training? And it's either one, something we're already doing, or two, it's something completely off the wall. Um, and it, it's just because they think they want to keep up with what everybody else is doing. So it's how do you manage that? Um, if it's, I heard someone else say before, you know, if it's not going to hurt the student athletes and you have time to do it, go ahead, throw it in make your coach happy, but at the same time, stick to what's tried and true. Um, now being the millennial generation, uh, I'm part of that, but I feel like the student athletes that come through now, especially the freshmen, I feel light years away from them. I'm 30 years old and I feel like I'm like a 90 year old grandma. I don't Snapchat, I don't have Venmo or whatever that is. Um, you know, but that's the way they communicate. Like I just got group me for the first time this semester. So, um, you know, it's, you got to figure out how to relate to your student athletes. Um, and social media is probably one of the biggest things to do that. Um, so overcoming per per perceptions is probably one of the biggest challenges I've had to face. Um, First off, with the football training mentality. Uh, we actually just had a coach this semester come in and say, you know, my girls, uh, I, I don't want them getting big. You know, you guys have a football training mentality here. What does that even mean? You know what I mean? Like, okay, um, that old, you know, thought process of everybody's gonna get big. A lot of it, Dr. Mann, you could probably say it goes down to genetics, right? Um, so, but also going along with that, um, as a female strength coach myself, I've had to face a lot. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of strength coaches are in their 30s. They're white males. 
um, and I'm a female. So I have to have an unshakable presence versus being more on the emotional female side. Um, actually, Phil Matus, who works football now at Ohio State, when I was with him at Villanova, he actually called me a bulldog. So being able to coach football um, and have that bulldog mentality and be able to get in your face and make sure that those guys are, oops, sorry, are accountable. Um, but then also being able to relate and say, hey guys, that was a great job. Um, but then also practicing what, what you preach. My athletes will see me under a bar, um, especially after just having a kid. You know, right now, I'm pretty weak, I'll say that. Um, but I still do what I do, okay? So I'll still squat, still bench, still do everything that I ask them. Every program that I give my athletes, I try out first. So they know I've done it. If I can do it, they sure as hell can do it. Um, your sport coaches, you'll have good relationships and bad relationships. I'm sure you guys can all tell a story of a bad relationship. Um, and that kind of comes from them questioning you or having disagreements over your application of programming. Um, but then that comes down to using scientific research, answering their questions why, communicating with them of why you do what you do. Um, and then I kind of said, earlier I talked about compromising, um, but maintaining your boundaries, saying, hey, we need to get X, Y, and Z in because it's gonna get them stronger, it's gonna prevent injuries, whatever it is, um, but say, sure, hey, you wanna go ahead and do some kind of core movement that you saw on YouTube? All right, we can put that in at the end, um, as long as it's not hurting them. Uh, they might minimize your education um, or your practical experience. So one of the examples that I have for this, um, a tennis coach that I've worked with started a PhD in strength and conditioning, never finished it, um, but was never a strength coach himself. So he thought that he knew more than I did. Um, but a lot of it came down to talking with him and collaborating, say, hey, this is what, you, you know the background of it, right? So help me out. What do you wanna see from your athletes? What's your goal? Um, and how do we get there together? Um, and then demand of time. We see this a lot at the division one level. Um, in the Olympic side, we all, right now at Pitt, we each have about three to four teams. But a lot of our coaches think that we're their only strength coach. So they want us out at their practices. They want us at games. Um, they want us doing data collection for them as far as running catapult and things like that. Um, so they really think that we're their only strength coach and so we don't have, you know, we're pulled in so many different directions. So then that comes down to gaining trust and earning respect and that's threefold. You have to do it from your, you have to get it from your student athletes, your sport coaches, and then your administration and or head coach if you're an assistant. So from administration, um, that starts out with just getting the job. So you have to convince them when you go in for your interview that you're the man for the job, you're the woman for the job. Um, and then once you get there, fulfilling and going beyond the expectations they have in place for you. Um, you know, never be content, always be invaluable because there's always someone out there that can take your job. From sport coaches, um, between communication and educating them on why you're doing what you're doing, a lot of times that'll just let them trust you. Um, and then that goes to uh, compromise and collaboration as well. Like those sport coaches I talked about in the previous slide, you know, you'll have to do a lot of that. Um, student athletes is probably the biggest thing. So understanding the millennial generation, like I talked about earlier, um, relating to them in different ways, you know, maybe putting on Drake, like Coach said. Um, but then communicating your expectations. I think that's one of the biggest things. If you don't tell the student athletes, um, especially nowadays, if you don't tell them what you're looking for or tell them what to expect, um, you're not holding them accountable. And then they're just gonna run and do whatever they want. Uh, but then also educating them and explaining why. So on a lot of my uh, program cards, each week I'll have a focus of the week and I'll have you know, a quote to kind of motivate them. Um, but on there too, I'll also put a little diagram of maybe whatever we're doing, an RDL, saying, hey, we're focusing on the hamstrings. Uh, 
probably a lot of times they'll just kind of look over that but at the beginning of the week we go over it so that they know um, and I found that a lot of times they start to understand and they start to say oh I know I should feel it here um, because they get to see it as well um, but getting to know your athletes and how they tick um, a football player might be a little bit different than a field hockey player um, and vice versa but then you know that's not just male or female there might be two football players that are completely different um, and you just got to kind of find out hey can I get in this kid's face does he like it a little um, you know respond that way or do I have to kind of pull him aside and talk to him one-on-one uh, -on -one? and then a want to versus have to training environment this was very big with our volleyball team um, the past year and a half uh, we had to create an environment that they wanted to be in instead of what they have to be in, or had to be in um, you know they came from a strength coach who did things a lot differently than what I do now um, and so they had to start believing in, when, in what I was doing um, and a lot of that just came from showing them results of what we were training uh, so a lot of it comes down to conveying your competence by communicating confidently and then that's going to make you credible with your sport coaches, your administration, your athletes. Um, another challenge would be salary and job security. So you guys all know um, that a lot of us probably have lower salaries, especially being on the Olympic side. We've got lower salaries than sport coaches and other support staff like athletic training, um, you know, academ academic support, things like that. As a female, uh, we probably make less than males and a lot of that goes down to because we don't work with football at the division one level and things like that. Um, but in a study it said that we made $40,000 less a year than males. So that's quite a bit more. Um, football and basketball strength coaches are often, as you guys know, um, often hired with the sport coach. Um, and so if that sport coach or that head coach leaves um, and or is let go, your job security is not 100%. Um, some, you know, at Pitt, we were actually lucky enough to keep our basketball strength coach on staff, but I know that's not uh, the same at a lot of other places. Um, but lower, sal lower salaries affect uh, job satisfaction. You guys all know that if you're not seeing rewards, you're not going to want to do a lot of the stuff that you, you're doing, um, which then causes position turnover at Pitt. I've seen out of five years, I've had five different assistants um, next to me. So we've had a lot of turnover there. Um, and we've, one of those coaches even left the profession uh, to do something else. So just because he wasn't getting paid enough. Um, and like I said earlier, there's always someone out there trying to break into the profession that's going to do your job for less. So make yourself invaluable. Uh, certifications. Unlike athletic training, we don't have a licensure. So we only have two uh, cert uh, accredited certifications, which is the NSCA and the CSCCA organizations who have the CSCS and the SCCC. Um, and along with that, the NCAA has a rule that you have to have a certified strength coach, but each institution can, you know, choose whatever that certification is. Um, so there's nothing across the board that holds us accountable, really. Um, and at the very beginning, you saw next to my name, I had a lot of letters. It doesn't mean shit, to be honest with you. Um, just because you have those doesn't mean that you're experienced for your job or that you're, you're the best person for that job. Um, so it all kind of comes down to, can you do your job? Can you prove yourself? Um, for our in, who, who is breaking into the field? Who's interns? One, two, three, okay. Um, so there's different ways you can do that. You know, getting your education, you need a master's degree now for most um, division one strength coaching jobs okay um, and then getting your certification like I said in the previous slide 
internships and assistantships, I'm, everyone here has probably done a million of them before actually getting a full-time job. Um, so there's unpaid, paid, graduate assistantships, different things that you have to do to kind of put your foot into the door. I think the biggest one though that it comes down to is networking and little events like this, putting yourself out there. That was probably my biggest thing as a um, breaking into the field is I was afraid to do that. Um, but Coach Watts put me out there. Um, he pushed me and made me go introduce myself. Um, my first conference, I was actually with Phil Matus, and he actually made me go introduce myself um, to Tommy, who was the strength and conditioning coach at the University of Hawaii. You know, I was terrified. I was like, holy shit, I don't know this guy. Like, I'm just this little female. Who do I, you know, why does he want to talk to me? Um, but he's still one of the, the contacts um, that I talk to when I need something. So there's little things like that um, that I think will progress you into the field. Um, kind of delving a little bit more into uh, networking and resources. There's so many different organizations out there that'll help you. Um, the NSCA has different uh, special interest groups uh, that you can kind of work with. Um, CSCCA, you know, they're specifically for collegiate strength and conditioning coaches. Um, all the conferences is a great way to network. Um, like I said, putting yourself out there. Um, and then don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call someone. Even if you don't know them, um, I don't think that you know strength coaches are mean. I think if we don't call you back, it's probably because we didn't get it, like Coach Mann said. Um, but a lot of those phone calls that I've done on research of, hey, what are you doing with your cross country team? Or hey, what are you doing with your softball team over there? You have a lot of success. Um, you know, it's great ways to just bounce ideas off and talk shop. Um, so family con conflicts. I think this is probably the biggest challenge that I've had within the last couple of years. Um, being younger, uh, one of the questions I had was, when is it the right time to start a family? Is there ever a right time? Um, one of my biggest things was I was afraid to be pregnant and be a strength coach. Um, but going through that, that was probably the best experience I've ever had. Um, I think a lot of the athletes looked at me more as a regular person than just as um, their strength, just as a coach, you know, removed um, from everything. So they saw me as a real person. Now my kid comes around, I put him in a front pack, and I coach him up that way on the weekends. You know what I mean? So there's, um, and he's probably growing up in the best environment that he can now. Um, but with established families, and all, a lot of the older strength coaches know, you can't do this without a supportive spouse. Um, I know my husband, he actually gave up his dream of strength and conditioning because he knew that I was gonna be more successful being a female in this field. Um, and so I appreciate that every day. I don't know if he knows that, um, but that means a lot to me. Um, but having the long hours, it's not a nine to five job. Um, it's hard, it's hard. Like the other day, I didn't pick up my son till 6.30 at night from daycare um, because I had a late night team. So um, being able to rely on your spouse. Um, we don't get paid a lot, so do you have the salary even to support your kids? Relocation wise, you know, if you have to pick up and go, we know that we move a lot because jobs open or you know, that job security is not always there. So you're really making a decision for your whole family. And then there's just a lot of stress that comes with it. You know, you, there's so much going on at work, but then you've got so much going on at life. How do you balance the two? Um, so after all those challenges, I think it all boils down to though, this field is relationship driven, right? It comes down to communication. It comes down to networking and having the relationships with your student athletes. If I didn't have the relationships with the student athletes, that I do now, um, I probably wouldn't want to do it. They really make me want to go to work. It's results driven. You see if your athletes are getting better, right? You see if your athletes are getting injured. Um, you get direct feedback all the time. Um, and even from your coaches, they'll tell you if they're not happy with you. Um, but it is rewarding and it's fun. And you get to wear sweatpants and tennis shoes to work every day. You don't have to wear a suit and tie. Um, so 
my last question then is why do you guys choose strength and conditioning? If you, anything, make sure that you have a passion for doing what you do, because if not, you're going to get out of this field really quickly. Um, and that's it. That's all I got. Did I really go through that fast? I feel like I flew through that. Yeah? No? Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Or is there anything else that you guys might have experienced that I missed? Um, challenges wise, is there anything that you guys have experienced yourself that might help us get better? No? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I got. If you ever need anything, contact me. I'm more than open to listening to you guys and answer any questions you have. So, thank you. <laughs>